Hey there, friends, YouTube Easters. I'm going to call this a spooky ball episode. This one's not plugged into my working computer. It's plugged into another computer, so I'm less worried about it taking over a mouse or whatever. So I just want, and the reason it's a spooky, uh, spooky ball episode is I am going to dive back into the the spook world of you know the CIA uh, archive here there's this Ho Chi Minh PDF which I can put the link in the comments I went through it pretty carefully uh, this morning I spent the day basically looking back on the Vietnam War and the reason I'm making this YouTube I wouldn't normally make a YouTube about everything I study because I study all kinds of topics, but I wasn't even looking for Bucky Fuller, but I came across this footnote C about a guy named uh, Charles Fenn, born in the United Kingdom, em emigrated to the United States in his early 20s, became a news photographer and journalist, joined the Associated Press in 1941, and covered the war in North Africa and Asia, including the Japanese invasion of Burma. In 1943, in New York, Buckminster Fuller now, he's a topic here in this blog, so you can see why I'm pausing to underline Buckminster Fuller, an advisor to the to OSS, recruited him. So who is this guy, Charles Fenn? Well, he goes on to uh, make contact with Ho Chi Minh because the OSS has a sudden urgent need for more intelligence from inside Vietnam, and the Japanese have just sort of shut down all the French operations. They were allowing the French, the, the Vichy France, whatever, Hitler's France, I guess you could call it, to keep their colonies. And Japan being allied with Hitler was like, yeah, we'll just sort of be there too to some extent. But uh, anyway, it became a long story. And what this article is detailing with the deer team and it's a well-known story you can hear vietnam vets tell it to you in fact today i was listening to several uh veterans and then after the um the study period i could go to the crowbar where i hang out and talk to an actual vet my friend glenn who was in the NSA and sent over there to uh, crack PT boat co codes, the Vietnamese uh, version of same. And he was stationed in Vietnam and so on. So we talked at some length also. A lot of big picture uh, discussion looking back. Now, just to remind you of my age, you know, I'm 61 now, which means I was not subject to the draft, and um, when I was of draft age, that was a window where I didn't even need to register, and that was convenient, because as a Quaker, you know, and so on, conscious objection, and blah, blah, I didn't have to face all that and do paperwork, whereas my dad, on the other hand, he um, he was ready to do the paperwork, but his number was never called. He did go on a troop ship to Japan at one point, but as a civilian is my recollection of what he, you know, what his adventures were. He was a very courageous guy, my dad, but um, didn't believe in outward violence and so on. But what's interesting with, with Fuller here is that, yeah, later, you know, on Grunch of Giants, for example, the CIA fi figures prominently and of course his close associate i wouldn't say you know he had a lot of close associates and i'd say his very closest associate was probably Osamu naguchi and then he worked with soji sadao and um and later kiyoshi kiramiya so all three of those were japanese heritage people that he worked closely with. And then E.J. Applewhite was, of course, a career CIA guy, and his name is on the Synergetics books. And he's the one I actually knew better than, you know, I spent more time with, I, I hung out with Kiyoshi Kiramiya in Philadelphia, and um, 
I went to Best of Friends exhibit about Osamu Noguchi's friendship with Fuller, but I did not ever meet him or Soji. Well, I might have met Soji Sadao at a, uh, a gathering at Applewhite's place. And Thomas Zung and Shirley Sharkey also, I believe, was there. That was Fuller's secretary for many years. So I got to meet some of these people. But that's around the time I found out my wife had breast cancer and I flew home from D.C. I didn't really get to hang out with Applewhite any in person after that. But he did come out to Portland before that. So, you know, I had considerable time with him. And also with his wife, June, I met her. Anyway, I'm just, because I'm scrolling through something at the CIA website, it makes sense to bring that all up. And also, I do have video about, was Fuller a cold warrior? And as I, as I was telling Glenn, you know, for me, the word cold war has a positive spin because the alternative is hot war. And of course, you could say, no, the alternative to war is peace. There could never be, I mean, war the opposite of war is peace, but at the level of archetype and metaphor and so on and 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 what life is like, I don't think we're going to purge war metaphors from the language. So as a psych, psychology guy, I'm okay with the idea of psychological warfare. It's just not blood and guts warfare. I would call that more inward warfare. And so Cold War, psychological war... That's all pretty much okay with me compared to blood and gu blood and guts blowing people apart war. I, I draw a strong line between those, you know. If you want to say, oh, but psychological violence is also violence, yeah, you can say that, but it's colder. And in the spectrum, I like to get to ice cold, like cryogenic war, which means it's it's more like just very cold. So people aren't hot-headed in a Cold War, in my in my picture. And I feel like Fuller, in wanting to work for all humanity, he was trying to leave a legacy where, you know, Russians would be just as happy. He didn't want statues to him. He was, like, said in a few places that he wanted his ideas to live on. It wasn't about statues. But figuratively, I think, uh, you know, having a statue to Bucky Fuller in... Russia would make a lot of sense. If you've read Critical Path, he worked hard to sort of give the Russians, a, a, put them in a very good light in Critical Path in a big picture way. But he wasn't anti-American, obviously. He, um, he balances everything really well, but he's not, you would say, partisan. And he, he wasn't grinding an axe because his his point was to work for all humans and he thought there was a way now to do that maybe for the first time to be really realistic and be pro-human in in a general sense chinese now have taken up the the grid idea and this article about south korea talking about a grid that would encompass china and russia and so on i think people who are interested in kind of a a mature, grown-up kind of way in sort of lessening global tensions, they're engaged in grid talk. Like, for this guy to be saying, you know, South Korea could be hooked up with the Japanese-led initiative and Russia and Japan would be involved. I mean, it doesn't talk specifically about North Korea, but hey, if China's involved, it just says linking the Korean Peninsula with China, Mongolia, Russia, and Japan. So given all the bad blood that's gone between these groups, right, all the World War II history, which I have been revisiting today, all except the snow, I don't know, what about cookies? I'll just leave this page. It just seems to me that grid talk is kind of where the adults are, except in the U.S. with all these PG&E meltdowns, instead of talking in a sort of adult-minded way about the grid in California and the problems it's all about who to lock up, and it's about money and screaming, and it's kind of infantile and juvenile. The U.S. political discourse has become very juvenile. And, you know, with Bucky, I felt like he was kind of an adult, 
And I feel like his ideas, including his mathematical ideas, unit volume, tetrahedron, tetra volumes, all that stuff he has in synergetics, it hasn't really gotten any adults' comments, really. I mean, of course, there's Amy Edmondson's book and my stuff, and people have worked on his ideas, but by and large, you know, like the philosophy department hasn't come back with anything very adult. And I think, in a way, maybe it's just Fuller's commitment to work for all humanity and having a military background as well as a civilian background and having patents and all that. The academic philosophers, the university types, just don't want him in the club. And so even though there's an opportunity for some very important adult discussion around world game and global grids and so on, we don't hear that from academia because it's, it's, um, they're not ready to cross that hurdle yet. Um, and talk, talk about the kind of stuff I talk about here on this channel. So I feel like we just have to go it alone in some ways and just continue on recreating our own sort of syllabus and school and you know you can you can learn this stuff on your own you don't have to wait to get a university degree and if, especially if you have this kind of technology here that I have with uh, the internet and all this other stuff so again with Fuller you could say that his goal was to work in such a way that it would make sense for any tribe or people to put up a statue in in sort of thank you or we respect you or whatever whether you're Russian or Brazilian or German or Czech Czech or uh, Ugandan if you want to talk about that the only thing you have to get over though is that he was not really very persuaded that our nation state system would perpetuate itself in the way that most people assume it always will like everything lasts forever when you're alive you think that and then of course it all goes away really quickly sometimes and uh, you know I could see nations as geographical areas kind of like zip codes and good for mail delivery and so on but you know if I want to say Judea and Mesopotamia around the Middle East and not really care exactly where the borders are because they're always changing anyway they talk about how sacrosanct, how sacrosanct borders are, but everywhere you look, they're not being respected. They are not. And so the nation-state system as a whole, it's either going to impose borders or not, and the U.S. is trying really hard, not on its Canada border, but on its Mexico border, to, um, to not go with the Bucky narrative. And that's okay. I mean, I can understand. There's a lot of momentum, and nobody's like, uh, he's not a dictator, and uh, his narrative in Grunch of Giants is just intelligent, that's all. So I'm sure everyone in the CIA who has any competence has read Grunch of Giants and so on. Good stuff about the car, CNN talking in favorable terms for a change, but nothing about synergetics. A fairly recent article, though. Let's go see how recent. I read that today too. It talks about how the car flipped over and the other car that was involved in that accident <coughs> had been removed from the scene by then. It all sounds very, you know, how did that happen? How can you have somebody die in a crash and the other car has been removed from the scene before, you know, it all sounds kind of like Chicago, pretty criminal. And what we've got to remember in a kind of stereotypical way, we've got to remember that Fuller had a good time in the Navy, right? He really, really enjoyed learning from the admirals and the admiralty. And then uh, being a radio man on a bigger ship, he didn't just have the little ship. He had uh, radio experience. He learned a lot, and then he had to go live as a civilian in Chicago and that's where he nearly committed suicide because suddenly Al Capone was carrying his wife's groceries upstairs he was working in a har armor meat plant I mean to go from 
the thrill of the Navy and not having to make money with his boats, as he put it, to unable to support his own family and his daughter, first daughter, dying. It was such a crash. And then he decided, you know, to go back to kind of what he was thinking about before that and commit to it. But it meant that he had to work for all humanity in, in his own mind. And that is a tough thing to do because, again, you have to work in such a way that you're not being partisan. And how do you do that? But if, if you think there's enough for everybody, it's easier. Okay, that's, that's good. Talk to you later.